Welcome to the Consummate Athlete Podcast, where we explore what it means to be a well-rounded, happy, goal-crushing athlete. Every week, myself, sports journalist Molly Herford, and cycling coach and kinesiologist Peter Glassford interview experts and chat through all of your training questions. We're excited to have you along for the ride. Hello, hello. Welcome back to the Consummate Athlete Podcast. Peter, how's it going? It's going well. I'm excited to be here today. We have a great guest, one of my favorite guests, a returning guest for, I think, the third time, which puts him in the running as, as some of the most frequent. I was going to say, I think it's down to him, Stacey Sims, and Ryan Leach, maybe? Could be. Could yeah. Be. Yeah. Well, I am excited about this one because you guys are talking all about, well, many things, but knee pain included. Okay, I'm not actually excited about this. I'm actually pretty mad about this, to be honest, because I think we may have accidentally manifested my knee pain. Sure. Uh, I don't manifest, but maybe you did. Well, we have we have this episode and we actually have a bonus episode coming later this week with my friend, Strong Girl Publishing author, Mackenzie Myatt, talking about her kind of battle with knee pain that really prompted uh, getting this episode going. Sure. Yeah. One of the questions in it, at least, but the we were speaking to greg about a running course he made that i took uh which was great and so i wanted to just follow up and, and sort of greedily get some follow-up questions with him but i thought it might be interesting for runners cyclists listening to our podcast to hear some of these answers about overcoming injuries and some of the different ways that greg and his movement optimism uh philosophy sort of addresses uh injuries especially for endurance athletes so really you set me up to start having knee pain is what i'm hearing well you were manifesting and that I might was. have been part of it yeah yeah so no more manifesting for me is really what we're, we're at with this uh, but no, Greg, I mean, honestly, I love his take on a lot of stuff as far as injury and pain goes, because I think he presents a really like reasonable recovery protocol, we're going to say. That's it. Uh, and, and it pushes back. You know, if someone's told you your SI joints are out of you know place or you've had, you know, your back is just the worst back they've seen on an x-ray or leg length discrepancy. If anything. You're a cyclist. So I, I think it's the stuff that this is normal and there's lots of ways we can get out of pain or manage pain. Maybe we won't get completely out of pain, but that's really where Greg's message and where I try and refer to Greg is when folks have, you know, gone the traditional route and, and, you know, they've gotten the ultrasound over and over and over again. Uh, you know, they've gotten massage or whatever and it's just not getting better they've been poking with the foam roller and, and so sometimes we have to start looking at some of these other factors the biopsychosocial factors associated with uh, being an athlete and then also with being in pain mm -hmm. so that's where we talk today is some of these strategies to to overcome and, and strengthen ourselves um based on this course the the reconciling biomechanics with pain science course is one of greg's courses and then the other course i took was the running resiliency best practices for sport management for the runner um and, and it was just great i really enjoyed it and recommend it. it's an online course that you can take uh but was very very good i actually just took i, I was telling greg offline that I, I had just taken a college course uh, around trail building and sort of mountain biking stuff for our local club and, and i would say that this course greg put together was far and above much better well, you were really better. upset about the trail course but that's that's <laughs> another episode for another us, time there you go that's an aside uh, so we talk about that. We talk about knee pain. And then also Greg has just launched. I was really excited because he was on another podcast uh, with another gentleman, another physio. And then that sort of, you know, as podcasts do, it, when it, uh, it sort of lived its life. And then Greg's now off on his own doing a great podcast, which I think is probably more for our listeners who are doctors, physios, chiros, you know, or just really into rehab and strength training uh, concepts or just into, you know, Greg's general spin on things. So the Movement Optimism podcast is out there on the uh, podcast players that you love uh, so it'd be great if you check that out love it love it cool well i think otherwise let's get into this and and, and enjoy this third episode with greg layman all right we're back greg layman is here he is many things. He is a physiotherapist. He is a lecturer. He is a course designer. He is a movement optimist and we are happy to have him back for the third time greg thank you for being here oh yeah my pleasure now there's so much we could talk about, but, uh, you know, first off, uh, I want to thank you because I just took your running resilience course and I really enjoyed it. Uh, lots of good ideas in there and, and so forth. So do you want to give maybe just even a brief, you know, who is that course for, you know, with a varied listenership, who would you recommend take that course? It's, I, I would say if you don't have any background in it, that that's the idea that my, my whole thing of like running injury treatment is to simplify it. And yet, as I was writing it, it kept getting longer and longer. 
because it's almost like you have to go through a lot of material to then come out the other end and say, okay, we can be simple here. But people don't often believe that until they go through the ringer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it, it's, if you have some experience and I've been treating running injuries with the basics for years, it, it may not be for you. It'd be a nice update on the literature, right. I would say. That's what I try to do. Sure. But you, you or, or it could be really um, bias reaffirming which I take courses to do that. I'm like, okay, I'm on the right track. <laughs> I gotcha. So you want your uh, ego stroked. That's and, the course. And for so you. you're saying, you know, as a lowly kin, I, I got through it. It was okay. There was a couple of things that I was like a little cross-eyed, but it was okay. As a kinesiologist, I got through. Um, It'd be perfect for a kin. That yeah. would be the idea. Yeah. Now on, we've had you on before talking about knee osteoarthritis and movement optimism and the cup stuff, the cup analogy that is. And, and so that's, oh, there's a lot of free content that is probably more, uh, patient centered or athlete centered on your YouTube channel as well, which we'll link to. Um, and that just keeps getting better. I don't know how you keep teaching yourself how to do all this video and, and all this, you know, YouTube, it just keeps getting better and it's personal improvement. It's amazing. Just, you just go on YouTube. I actually, my, uh, my software is really easy. And so you just, you just double down on that. Okay. I, well, I don't what's use the any software of the secret. Screen, I use screen flow. Okay. That's it's cheap. It's Mac based. It, it's limited, but it's really good for editing and and then adding B roll and adding basic graphics. It's it's certainly not as good as the Adobe Suite, but I don't know for a, a five percent improvement, it it wouldn't be worth it. When some of that stuff gets more complicated, uh, if you don't know what you're doing, you get in trouble, right? <laughs> you produce oh, something yeah. worse. Yeah. No, because if to edit a video like a fifteen minute video, might the editing could be three hours sometimes. Sure. Sure. You know, you, and you get in the weeds, and no one cares but you. <laughs> now the other podcast i think both podcasts we've referenced that you know you're doing backflips you're doing tumbling these sort of things as you know you're a we'll say you're an adult man you're not a young 10 year old no. boy uh, no, i just turned 50 yeah. anyone who's on the youtube channel can can check this out i guess uh so you're starting this new podcast you've gone out on your own podcast and here the movement optimism podcast i've enjoyed the first what are we at five episodes i've taken them all in i'm gonna say five i don't know if there's yeah five sure yet. <laughs> I've so, so what's 10, the point yeah. why are you doing it why are you why are you podcasting oh i so i i was doing stuff with adam meekins uh, mm -hmm. for years which was great was too oh i loved it yeah adam's great and it, it was good but this just gave me a, a little bit more we weren't doing as much and adam's super busy and so i just wanted to bust out some stuff and then uh do it and and how i wanted to do the podcast which i haven't even done yet one of them actually i did one today with alex hutchinson and so that was the closest thing where i wanted to have more rigorous debates with people where I was going to do a episode called tell me why I'm wrong, where I take a really strong stance on something so, and someone has to argue with me. And what it morphed into is like, initially I'll see someone, we'll talk about the stuff. And then when they come back for part two, that's where we have the drag out uh, debate. Cause I really think people can learn a lot by having not for forceful, but polite discussions to really see people's thought process there. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted more flexibility. That's why we did the podcast. And I like you sort of have to test people out and make sure that they're okay with that. And then you bring them back and you get them. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So I always ask, is it okay? <laughs> you need like a safe word. That was the idea. Definitely. Yeah. 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 It's, like, it's like your career hinged on this debate. Yeah. You know, yeah. No one's allowed to cry in my podcast. <laughs> cool. Well, uh, the one question you ask on that, maybe I'll jump down here. There's no order to any of these things I was thinking. We're on to the, the podcast. So, you know, the one question you've been asking people on that is when does form and technique matter? Um, and, and, you know, around this movement optimism, which will work around the definition here. We've talked about it on past episodes too, but I, I guess I was curious on uh, why did you choose that question uh, as a recurring question so far in your podcast? Oh, I think it's the big, I think because it, it, it's the fundamental, certainly of, of my uh, so it, it, it's, let, let me go back a sec it's essentially what movement optimism is based on for so long people are told they get injured because they have bad technique or something like that mm -hmm. and i've really rejected that through the years i think it's just a negative and pessimistic view of the body and ignores its ability to adapt and it makes you focus on things that are less important when it comes to injury and to a lesser extent for, for performance and so i always want and and it's a it's a topic where people have really strong opinions both directions so it's for sure so so far it's just been an echo chamber <laughs> a little bit yeah you've you got on the first five were softballs for you, you oh know? oh yeah yeah it, it's yeah so that's okay but that because we, we phrase it when is it important 
for the prevention or injury risk reduction. And that's where it seems like, nah, no one really seems to care that much. We've had a shift in the profession for a while. But then when you say, well, are there times for technique or how you move is important? And it might be like, yeah, performance, right? There's probably a way that you set up your bike to mm-hmm. produce more force through the pedals versus another one. You you, you wouldn't have the you have a seat dropper that you guys have. You wouldn't we do have, have that it. now. Yeah. yeah. You wouldn't do that if you're on the road and trying to ride to California. Right. So, no, you'd notice. Yeah. As someone who's, yeah. My seat was just slipping actually on my road bike and it's, it ruins the day. It, it, it doesn't sure. go on very long. Right. So that's, per- so that's like a perfect example. And then the, the next one we'd ask like, well, when you're injured, sure. It, like I'm sure you tweak your bike positioning based on what's sore. Yeah. That's a no brainer. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So that, that, that's a thrust. Right, right. And so I think it is the curious thing, because probably if you're listening to this podcast, the listener who is listening to this podcast would say, you know, probably has been to somewhere where they've told them, you know, they, uh, you know, their their knee is sore because they've been heel striking running, or they've, yeah. they collapse their knee when they squat too much or or something like that, right? And, and that might not necessarily be why they got injured. Is that the idea? No, because they like, and, it, but that doesn't mean changing your heel strike isn't an option to help you with pain mm-hmm. you can certainly, but then you could probably go back to heel striking right and so i guess that, importantly it doesn't mean that if i'm a heel striker and i'm not injured i shouldn't necessarily it's, be chasing exactly. four foot running or something it's, it's, it's too too com- too complex to make those simple uh, assessments there or mm-hmm. like here, here's the thing like so often someone could have a beautiful textbook squat form and they could have knee pain and no one would say oh that's because you have perfect squat technique like we, you know what I mean? Like you look like the textbook. So like we, we too often attribute causation to something where we shouldn't. That's why you need research because mm-hmm. you can't, you can't trust your lying eyes. Yeah. Now you do say when, so is there not to get nitty gritty on you, but you do say when almost as if like, you're, you're not saying like, does it matter? Is that to like lead the person into it? Or is it because you suspect there are situations where it matters? I do say when, cause we want to ask when, when do biomechanics, uh, matter that's a that's a good so for a long time i thought like maybe technique would matter under very very high loads and i i would agree with that like i'm i always say i'm not gonna i think i can do a squat and my knee can cave in i can run and people's knees can cave in but and i can but i wouldn't jump off a building onto one leg with my knee caving in and try to let stick that landing Mm -hmm. that'd be too much yeah, I, that's an extreme example, but that, it is. That's, and I was going through this yesterday because I was like, "Well, what if Greg asked me?" And then I'd be like, "But that." Then you would start saying, "I think that it's not technique; like you've just overloaded the tissue, right?" And, and you could have landed in a perfect one leg squat and just well, driv- driven your leg through the ground. In that, so case. the technique there would be land on two legs and roll onto your side and roll out of it. So there is a, a technique. Uh, there okay. would be less options there. Under I see. so that that's where we we do something like that. Yeah. Yeah, and, and say, or, or the easiest one to say when when technique matters is again, it's just shifting the way you move to have less pain. Mm-hmm. It, it it doesn't mean that there's one right way. It's just less sensitive at the time, and that's a wonderful way to keep you moving. Sometimes that's why we limp. <laughs> and and we will probably talk about a couple. I will try and get specific with a couple examples for you today too, to just sort of work through how we would talk through. You know, a lot of times, you know, people come to you. I think with pretty complex, like you know, quest. You know issues that have been around for a long time. So we'll try and talk about that. But I guess one other example that I think about as far as moving pain is with a a cyclist, sometimes, you know, you have front of knee pain, you can almost raise the seat. And then if you have, you know, back of knee pain, it's like sort of a lowering the seat and cycling is weird, I guess, because we have this machine we're attached to. Um, But that would be an example where the technique might change a little bit because of the pain you have, right? But you might just leave it if everything's good. Yeah. Exactly. And so when you get caught up into like, there's a, the ideal or the right way to do something, then you don't have those options to move with less pain. Mm-hmm. So that's the point of movement optimism. Like there's lots of ways you can do this. And if you just look around and see it, you'll, you'll see high performers with different technique. That just tells us right, right there without the science. I just said, you need research. Okay, fine. You can, <laughs> You're outliers. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I work a bit with uh, Rob Gray, who's a researcher, at Arizona State uh, University, and like constraints led approach and yeah. uh, that sort of stuff. I don't know if you ever heard. Of it. He'd be a good guest oh. too. And so he talks a little bit about, 
you know, he's big in baseball. So as you start seeing like people throw faster and faster and faster, the number of solutions to that problem, like how are you going to throw a hundred mile fastball? Like it gets narrower and narrower, yeah. like the the options that you can, <laughs> you just can't do it in goofy ways. Exactly. Um, and so it starts narrowing, but that doesn't mean that there isn't variability within that. Certainly. Yeah. That's um, performance, right? Mm -hmm. It is. Yeah. 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 No, I would agree that heavier. That's why I mentioned jumping off a roof. There's less ways to land safely. Right. That's a, <laughs> The, the, I didn't know that Rob taught that stuff because I would, yeah. Totally yeah, the agree. variability piece, because that's like the big argument is that in the skill development, you like would you train the perfect way to do it. Like there's one way to throw a ball or one way, you know, for us to like hop a log or or something like that. But there's, you know, all sorts of ways you'd solve it depending on your body and how tired yeah. you are and the, the t speed you're coming in or whatever, right? There's a million. And then the same person wouldn't do it differently. And that in fact, it's better to have, many solutions to hopping over a log or throwing a ball yeah yeah yeah, yeah. he's a really steps. neat guy yeah that I, I i would talk because deadlifting would be an example like people you have the jefferson curl which is straight leg and you're rolling forward and lifting heavy weight that that's not the best way to deadlift it's totally safe but no one would say if i'm going to lift lift the most amount away from the floor i'm just going to keep my legs straight and round up my spine mm-hmm Right. Mm -hmm. So the deadlift, they all kind of look the same, but there's lots of variation within it. Some people will have a more rounded spine. Other people will be more neutral. Mm -hmm. you, you know what I mean? Like it, it's, it's the person that tells, they, they figure out the right way for them to lift. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So we have movement optimism. We've bandied about this, <laughs> this, this question that you ask. Uh, so people are ready when they come onto the podcast or when they listen to your podcast. Uh, I wondered too, if we go back to the running resilience course, I thought maybe there are a couple of takeaways for the athletes, for the patients that I, I thought were sort of interesting. The, the first one was sort of these styles of coping. I don't know if that's what you call it or not, yeah, yeah, but yeah. the endurance copers. Exactly. Um, I wonder if you talk us through those sort of two buckets, if if there's only two, I thought there was only two. Um, yeah. yeah. So there's two. So this is the, so they're coping. I mean, someone has pain. And you want to say one way to talk about it is so how do they cope with that? That So like the most famous one would be the avoidance coper. This is the classic low back pain. Someone is fearful, so they avoid doing things that hurt. And that's okay at the start, but it's usually not good two years down the line. So they just start living in a smaller and smaller like circle of, of their life. And they, they avoid moving and movement is in general good for the body. So that, that fear avoidance person where is, is not helpful. And then you have the, the endurance coper who can overlap with that, but often they're the person who, I actually do see this in cyclists. If you have seen the one guy I'm thinking of, it was like, he, he's maybe 40 and he was really competitive when he was 20. So he likes to push himself, likes to be at the front of the pack. He'd have low back pain. And then when he gets back into cycling, he hammers all of his workouts, right? He pushes into pain, which is fine for the most part for many people, but way too much. Instead of the 80-20 rule, he's the 20-80 rule. Like, you know, 80% is at a super high intensity thing. Um, he And then his back is so bad, he, he would classically, you know, take three weeks off, but then jumps right back into it when it starts to feel better. That's the endurance coper. I saw a joke in the, in the physio world when it comes to pain. It's like, poke the bear, but don't hump the shit out of it. This guy's like a bear humper, right? right? He's okay. making babies. So like that, that, that's what we're looking for is that, that it's just too much. We still have to respect the body and its ability to adapt and the nervous system can just get cranked up. Mm. So that's the two crudely. And probably it's a spectrum, but probably yep. that people do cluster. Like, especially once you get, maybe some people don't know or are familiar because they haven't, they've been fortunate not to have, you know, pretty bad pain or persistent pain. Um, but probably most of us go one way or the other, I would think. Yeah. Or, or, or what you'll see, the classic avoidance coper just gets pissed and then they do way too much too soon. And then so they're an endurance coper and, 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 they, and all of those they things. Bounce. Yeah. They bounce back and forth probably, right? You're like, oh, yeah. I'm going to not do it at all. And then I'm going to come back at 100%. Yeah. And then there's like, there's a successful endurance coper who pokes into pain and it's great and they're doing okay. And then there's the unsuccessful. People want to read up on this. Yeah, uh, it's Monica Hazenbring. She is the researcher in this field. And mm. She's been writing about this for over a decade. And she'll get into the different subtypes. I don't get into that. I don't, sure. I know enough words. Now, is there anything, you know, as if we're all listening objectively and we sort of identify, I'm certainly the person that will keep pushing until I end up in the hospital eventually. Um, 
right? So knowing that about thyself, like, is there anything to be done, uh, you know, if you were in one of those buckets? Yeah, get a coach. Uh, <laughs> like, no, I'm serious. It's the classic, like, we. Uh, w w there's, I don't know this research well, sorry, but it's the the old research on um, on runners who get injured. The, it seems like perfectionism is a risk factor for injury where they don't have flexibility in their coping. So if they design their own training program and it says, Today you're doing a tempo run. I know running lingo more than that's fine. Um, so they might be feeling like garbage and they're sick and run down, but because it says they have to do the six K tempo that day, they do. And that's mm -hmm. the day they should be doing the four K hike or like an easy jog, you know, right. so that, and then that, they don't check with a coach or they don't have one, like you say, yeah. Right? Cause I always yeah. am like, it was in the plan, but you didn't tell me you had debilitating back pain and you know, exactly. exactly your knee was swollen like a cantaloupe. That seems odd. <laughs> yeah. And that's that. I know Alex Hutchinson, he wrote about that years ago, some nice and probably an outsider runner's world of the, the coping, the psychological traits that predispose people to, to injury. Hmm. Yeah, the, uh, uh, that was one thing I was going to ask you. You know, it's it's tough sometimes. I have a few clients, you know, whether it's, you know, into therapy or into, you know, they're seeing a physio or a doctor. And I still feel like in Ontario, maybe we just stay Ontario-centric here. It is tough still, you know, even as a kin, I feel like those connections between the practitioners, you know, it, it's tough because of privacy. Would you agree? Like, is it hard? You know, do you ever wish you could just talk to the coach and be like, hey, what's going on with this person? I, if you get permission, you can. Yeah. Yeah. You always want to check that out. It, it It's fine. Uh, or it's nice when you work with coaches where you're on the same page. Mm -hmm. Like I work in Ontario, I'll work with Steve Boyd. Sure. You know, Steve. Yep. Um, but I feel like he 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 sends people to me because he knows what I'm gonna say and it agrees with what he's gonna say. That that's where you want everyone on the same page. Mm. That's what's all uh, it's very difficult if you're very different. That's where it it, it can be uh, trouble. Well, and likely I see a lot of, you know, the type A or perfectionist, which is, you know, probably myself as well. I'm not, it's not saying, not putting shade on anyone. Um, but I think that is where sometimes that messaging, you'd, you'd want it, you know, whether we agree or not, like probably there should be agreement, right? But then it's like, how far down this, like making some super team, you know, for a athlete, do you go, right? I don't know if we're, we're not usually working with, you know, Super Bowl money or something on yeah. this, but yeah. Yeah, it's hard. Oh, or when people don't, this is always hard when you're someone in pain and you have a team of people working with you. When it does look like they disagree, you always just want to, like, when I work with a patient, I know I'm saying something than maybe what their doctor said. I always acknowledge that there's some uncertainty here and I hope they're okay with that. And I kind of apologize, you know, and I just want to, I want them to understand why I say what I say. And then I try to understand what their doctor might be saying and how mm. it shouldn't change too much what we're doing, but it's okay that there's different views here. And I thought that was a good point in the course too, was, or a good approach to exactly what you're saying, where, you know, you try and upfront say like, you know, we don't exactly know this is going to work. You're not a car, right? So you're, you might come back, yeah. you know, with pain and we'll try something differently. It's not, you know, don't quit and don't, you know, just push in a hundred percent because it's starting to hurt. Um, yeah. I thought yeah. that was a good insight. It's the, that's the idea behind like patient centered care. It's, it, it's, it's that they're the partner with you and you kind of lay it out on the table, their options. And then you work work with what they're what they want to do and what they can do at that point in time. It's weird though, because sometimes people, I think I'm like this. You just want to be told what to do. I don't need your goddamn problem solving with me. I came into you. You tell me what's wrong and just fix it. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I don't want to be your partner. So I see fine. that a lot. Yeah. I can do yeah. that too. <laughs> Even with coaching, right? It's like, you know, just tell me the exact power yeah. and everything. And you're like, well, I mean, the body's a little variable. <laughs> Nope. <laughs> yeah, that, uh, that's fine too. You know, your device is only accurate to a few percent. Like it's yes. okay. Anyhow, uh, let's keep going. These next two are a little sexier, I think. A little more, you know, service for the 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 listener. So, it, it, once we have, say, we have a runner. You know, we're getting some some knee pain. We'll say we'll keep it fairly simple. Um, it seems like if I take my takeaway from the course with that sort of increasing cadence, assuming it's not already very high, is a good sort of mulligan option once in pain. Would you agree with that statement? Sure. With a runner. Yeah. That that's easy as a temporary change to change the stress on, mm -hmm. on, 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 on the knee. Yeah. I mean, the easiest thing, I, I actually don't do lots of that until people have tried other stuff, but for gait changes, if you're mm -hmm. going to change how someone runs cadence there, boom, that's your, that's your best option. And it, it seems to clear up a lot of stuff. 
Yeah. Yeah. And even as a temporary, I love that you had a form fartlicks, which I am familiar with fartlicks, of course, but the idea of form and just sort of mixing up, which isn't even necessarily cadence, I guess, but you said, you know, just on a, on a run, just try and run a little different here and there. I just made it up. I think actually people have done this through the years by accident. It's yeah. just the hypothesis. Maybe we just need different stress. So like, and I live in Toronto, so there's mm -hmm. no terrain. So the train won't have me run differently. So I have to actively try to run differently to get different stress, or maybe I prepare the tissues differently. So I forefoot, a heel, a long stride, a short stride, faster, sure. sideways. Yeah. But you and run in trails? Mostly. We do a bit of both. But... So what, what does the trail do to your running technique? Yeah. Is it automatically, right? Yeah. So that, and there, there's a theory on why trail running might be easier on people because it induces that variety. Mm -hmm. That's the hype. That's my hypothesis. I think or we see that in mountain biking too versus road, right? Like it's just oh, more, okay. it's more dynamic. Like you have to stand all the time and you're always like front and back of the saddle and, you know, descending. Right. So like, whereas road and especially indoor cycling, you know, it's like one position always seated, you know, pretty much. So, yeah. Or it's like the office worker sitting is not horrible, but if you have to sit for eight hours a day, it's just hard to do the same thing. Mm -hmm. And then, so you stand for a bit, but then if you talk to a cashier, they're like, I hate standing. I want to sit for a bit. Do you, yeah. you know what I mean? Like not, not one isn't better than the other. You just want the variety. We've there. been going to run club down here in Brevard and there's a great group. Really, really fun. Uh, they meet at a brewery. The brewery is the main reason we're going for afterwards. Um, I, I know but there's that. a, the guy who runs it is a sort of a contractor, I think. Uh, he's been like standing on scaffolding. And when he starts the run, like you would love it. it he like, can barely like he's like a stick man like barely and he says it's because there's these micro movements in the the scaffolding he's standing on for like eight hours of the day and he's just oh. ruined but then by the end he actually is running pretty smoothly it's like really I honest up. yes i guess <laughs> yeah. there is work on that and occupational laborers who lift that that adding sitting to their day is healthier for them and then there's work with the office worker we're adding standing in the day is healthy for them. right which is tough yeah it's tough because you want to have that big like sitting is death yeah it's not so bad you got it a little bit of both that's it it's easy see you yeah. overcomplicate things uh i think that's good on kate and so again if you have the the pain then maybe just mix it up even for temporary and i like that too that it's not like forever but it's you know just it gives them someone something to do you know go out and just you know instead of doing intervals today just practice you know can you run it 80, 85, 90 RPM, what? 180. Yeah. What, yeah. 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 Cool. And, and if you do do that, know that if you run with a heart rate monitor or you uh, have a sense of effort, it will be harder. Your heart rate will go up like eight beats, 10 beats. Sure. So mine does when yeah. I bump it up. You look like you're prancing running. a little bit across the road. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and it won't feel good. Um, and yeah, so that happens. But that that the research would say that, that tends to change in six weeks. Maybe you get used to it. Not many yeah. studies in there. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the last one then was around sort of, I said speed kills, but this idea that, you know, the forces, and I I get confused by these graphs. This is where my kin brain gets trouble. So you might need to help me here. But as the speed comes up, then the forces essentially are increasing like exponentially uh, in running. Uh, would you agree with that? I feel like I'm, I'm simplifying it somewhat. Uh... Do you know where I'm going? So the argument was sort of like the people who train in the middle ground, at least how I took it, was that they would be experiencing more forces uh, because of the increasing speed. Uh, yeah, like it kind of depends. It's it's weird, surprisingly. So I think with the Achilles tendon, the calf, when you increase speed, yeah, there'll be more calf uh, strain. Um, and then, but sometimes I think when it comes to the knee, there it, it's not as much as you would think it does increase a little bit but after a while it's not the same i don't get too caught up on the academics there mm. and so and then and then what people have tried to model through the years i, I know what, i know what part of the course you're talking about i haven't i don't memorize this stuff anymore because it doesn't matter for clinic it's just academic uh is it, they try to estimate how the tissue will break down that's, mm -hmm. that's the injury stuff. And speed is inconsistent because it's like, although loads might be more, it's a different type of load and it might not be injurious to the tendon. Mm, okay. that, that's, that's, I think that's the paper that you're thinking of. Mm. So people can debate, but then anecdotally, I'm sure when you work with people and introduce speed work, their calves are really sore for a while. And that's often the thing that leads to tendinosis. So mm. it's a, it's a bit weird, the academic stuff. So the Achilles for sure increasing speed will increase the load in the Achilles. Tendon. Especially with speed work. Yeah. 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 That makes sense. 
the knee's different because like you you might have a slightly stiffer knee and if your knee doesn't bend as much then the moment like the the torque about the knee won't be the same and if the torque is less then there can be less load on the kneecap that's sort of the idea where the where you don't see a dramatic like if you go from very slow jogging to picking it up the the load will increase but i think there's a point where it kind of plateaus there mm. Hmm. Okay. That, that I think makes sense. I mean, I think that, you know, the speed work definitely is a piece there. I, I had interpreted it a bit as, you know, the people who run in the middle ground intensity, they're always trying to push to like, you know, five, four and a half minute Ks when they should be running at five and a half, six Ks. They're like taking on more strain or or load or however we want to just call that. Oh, you could, you could argue that. Yeah. Yeah. That, yeah. that would be true. Yeah. Yeah. That would be like, so it would be sort of, an, I was hoping for an argument. Yeah, an argument for very slow to, yeah. to medium. Oh, yeah. You can totally make that argument. Okay. Like, there's Good. no benefit for running. <laughs> like, if your easy pace is a six minute kilometer and I don't know, your 5K pace is a four minute, there's not a good argument to do lots of five minute Ks and, and stuff like that. Which is that. what there's you just, see, right? Yeah. 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 So that, that, that you could say, yeah, because that will increase the load and it may not be worth it. If you can get the same fitness benefits with potentially less strain. Mm. That might be injurious. I know this is all debatable because you could argue, oh, if, as long as you slowly build up to it, you're, you're okay. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. Yeah. yeah sorry. You're not going to get strong opinions out of me. That's okay. <laughs> yeah. No, you're getting softer. I feel like we used to get these out of you, but no, no more. So it, I think I would, because there's strong opinions on the other side before. Like uh -huh. the people are like, oh, you have to do this. And right. usually when I have a strong opinion, it's just arguing against someone who says it has to be done like this. Right. But does it have to? Yeah. 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 No. Okay, well, let's keep going here. I think, you know, a couple of the other things I, I liked there was around jumping. It's something jumping in plyometrics, which we can maybe even define that here as your first question. Um, I've never done, uh, included a ton of it in my programming personally or or for clients. So I, I was really excited about all the stuff covered in it. So do you want to give us just that brief definition there? Like what's the difference between jumping and plyometrics? So a jump, you could just do one jump, right? You jump up in the air. All right. That's what a jump is. <laughs> you, you go, you go in the air. A plyo would be like doing several jumps in a row. Would mm -hmm. would, would be one. So you and that would be like bounding forward two legged. Some people will call bounding going from one leg to the other, but plyo just means like you decelerate your body and then you explode off the ground. You have to have what's called the stretch uh, shortening cycle. So that's mm -hmm. a classic plyo or a, a plyo would be someone skipping if you're just skipping rope or right, hopping right jumping yeah. so is there's, there's no pause in between or balancing it's just like multiple jumps no in yeah exactly because a jump program could be you just jump as high as you can you rest a couple seconds jump again mm -hmm. a plyo program would be related to jumping this would be still a plyo you you jump off a box hit the ground and explode up that's a plyometric sure. even though it's a jump but it, you had that like yeah that eccentric fast component followed by the and yeah. generally people should start with the single jump like a jump option rather than going straight to plyometrics would you say i guess skipping's well, hey, pretty no, skipping's you, pretty easy though yeah, isn't it yeah this is it you probably start this is where you gotta play around i've injured a few people in my time yeah said <laughs> that of course uh, i've injured myself um uh, but i because i used to work with like 18 year old girls or uh, women and uh they're so fit, we could throw anything at them and they would be fine with the plyo program. So start start light. You can either start like just skipping a little hops or if you go jumping and like a max jump, you do one to three and then three minutes of rest and then, you know, three jumps with, you know, lots of rest. You just got to really go slow. So it depends on what, on what you're doing. Mm hmm now, in the course, you talk about uh, a five-minute routine, which I always find yeah. some of these routines. I'm like, I don't. I think this would take longer than five minutes. But uh, the routine was basically five minutes where you start with ten seconds of of hopping on the yeah. spot, yeah, and, and then you rest for fifty, and then you do that five times, and then gradually over, I think, what was it, a six number, weeks, six weeks, it, it increased the amount of work and the decreased the rest, still five minutes. Yeah, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. I, I, yeah, I, I, uh, I've, uh, so all I do, and I, I, I'm doing that today. I just do, uh, I think it's too much for the average person. It, it's weird. Cause they, and they actually want each hop to be maximal. So what they did is that, so at six weeks, so the first week, 10 seconds of hopping, you rest 50 seconds. The next week would be 10 seconds of hopping, rest 40 seconds, and then 10 seconds again, and then 10 seconds of hopping 30 seconds. And by week six, you, you do 10 seconds of hopping, 10 seconds rest. 10 seconds, 10 seconds hopping, 10 seconds rest for the whole five minutes. 
So that's a lot of hopping, right? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it's supposed to be maximal effort. And if now if you're doing maximal effort and that many hops, mm. you have fatigue coming into play. I don't, I think it's too much. Like, yeah, because it's not just on. jump rope, right? Like people who no. box, you know, they would jump rope for five minutes. That's not, yeah, it's yeah. supposed to be max. Plyometric training in general, power training is like max effort once you're warmed up and once you've done it for a few weeks and built up, you're, every jump is almost maximal. That's the idea. That's why. I get mad with my kids who are in cheerleading and they do jumping for conditioning. Mm -hmm. Like you don't do plyometric for conditioning to get fitter. It's you should be fresh. Like that's right. the idea. Everything's right. maximal. It's a nervous system, probably connective tissue too, but like, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. So that, that program is weird. I would wonder, could you just get away with like 10 maximal hops, rest a minute, 10 maximal hops, rest a minute that I would love to see that paper redone. I feel well, like one. And it's funny. My first reading of it was that actually you just, that's what you did. You did like every minute on the minute, you did 10 seconds of jump and you just kept doing that for, you know, six, 12 weeks and, and you'd yeah. be good. <laughs> but this is like, could you imagine like 10 seconds max hops, you only get 10 seconds rest, do it again. Like that's, I don't mm -hmm. know. It's becoming more like interval training. Um, yeah. And so the idea with this was that it was going to increase, like, it's, it's good for what? I always say, like, you got, we got to sometimes back up when people ask me, is this good? It's like, for what? <laughs> what were you trying to accomplish? So this is for running economy. Yeah. This was studied for. Yeah. Uh, and in more like not elite runners necessarily, but people who maybe are time crunched or aren't maxing out their run volume. Uh, yeah, that's like a lot of those studies. But I, again, you'd want to see it repeated in people who are intermediate to advanced runners. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. like done in the other areas sure yeah but now, it's nice for bone density you think you so yeah 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 it's probably overkill uh but in general the bone density research is just boring old hopping once a day and daily seems to be better than three times a week mm -hmm. just the way bones work yeah mm -hmm. so this one we're talking about was five days a week yeah the daily hopping oh it was okay yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah, because it's weird. On one hand, I you know I think I like the the ten seconds because I can do that like while I'm walking the dog. Like he'll stop for ten seconds and then you know there yeah. you go. It sort of fits, right? You look like a bit of a goof, but I, I like that stuff that you can sort of just sprinkle into the day a little bit. Yeah. But if you start hopping <laughs> vigorously for ten seconds, uh -huh. you know, for five minutes, that's getting a little intense. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. yeah. Now the the bone density because that's interesting right now. Like I'm sure you see some of this stuff where especially with the research around menopause and that sort of thing that, you know, everyone should be lifting heavy and everyone should be doing jumps and increasing their protein and this sort of stuff. That seems, especially in the cycling world, this is a big, big trend right now. Yeah. Um, but the hopping and the jumping seems to be getting less play. And I'm not sure why, because it seems more accessible. Do you think it's because like, I just can't imagine it's the injury risk. There's injury risk to lifting a barbell or, or something like this too. Um, what do you think it is about jumping? Oh, I, I think a lot of research, you need a social media person and a marketing team. That's all it is, <laughs> for sure. There's yeah. some great researchers that are one-tenth as famous as other ones, and people never hear it and it never gets adopted. There's a yeah. massive amount of, of spin and sh spiel that has to occur. So I, I don't know. I, I recommend it. Like There's old research from Christine Bailey with perimenopausal women, and all she did was daily hopping, five mm -hmm. sets of ten. Mm -hmm. slowly progressed it as hard as you can and like daily was and improvements in bone density mm -hmm. yeah it would it'd be it's easy to do and you could argue just for calf strength and power and elasticity that seems to for healthy aging our calves seem to decrease their mobility yeah their yeah it just seemed like the the there it seemed like there was a pretty clear benefit at the end of it all right and it's you know yeah. versus having to buy or get to big dumbbells and start deadlifting you know it just seems you know, probably good to also do that. We agree on that. Yeah. But but if you're trying to convince people to do something and, and this is a five minute thing, you know, it seems you beautiful know, to start. Yeah. No equipment. Yeah. I had mentioned I sent you the wrong study. And, and so it's a very similar one. And the only difference was there was two different jumps. They did a they wanted a side to side or multi-directional one. Yeah. And they wanted a two legged, I guess they call it a linear jump. So I guess essentially a box jump or a squat jump or something yeah. up in the air, or I guess just hopping. And they did it with elite level cyclists and they were looking more at the bone density and they tried to enter it. So they wanted them to do it five times. And they thought the most interesting finding was that they did it three times. <laughs> <laughs> they wanted five, they did three uh, across the board. Um, 
and they did find that in the the femoral head uh was it, or the greater trochanter i guess they saw actually a change in the bone mineral density but not in the spine or the hip as much yeah not not surprised and that's what they said that like because of the upper body isn't really involved and stuff like that we're amazing at damping right mm -hmm. that's so once it gets to the spine that's why your eyes don't bulge out of your head when you hop because mm. we've dampened it all the way up <laughs> the system right yeah we're just, just i don't know we are good at that yeah just, so do you think then is that you know if, if we look beyond just cycling and running performance like that's where i start wondering like is like the good old plyo push-up is that something that like would maybe get at that or do you think that's where it's like well you need to actually start weightlifting now to get at some of those here's the thing i i would before the other i would say you have to train heavy like squats right five sets of five less than like heavy load to do it my friend neil mai who's on the podcast he's the kettlebell physio and he did a study where they're swinging the kettlebells heavy but still not 30 reps sometimes so it wouldn't be technically very heavy um and he they didn't in a few people, they actually did measure bone density. It wasn't, it was just a bonus, like a few cases that he looked at and there were imp improvements in bone density. So it's weird. It wasn't the heaviest stuff, but they got improvements in bone density. So I- Using I kettlebell swings, you're saying? Kettlebell swings and all these other, and, and Turkish get-ups, just a really nice, well-rounded program, hard style kettlebell. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, well, what else is going on? Like, why are, are they improving? And I always- this is just me theorizing folks <laughs> a view a view of the body is like an ecosystem right meaning the health of the ecosystem is really important so if you have reds or relative energy deficiency your ecosystem's not that healthy and you're prone to losses in bone mineral density so we would say we want to address that reds so and improve the ecosystem so are there other ways to address the health of the ecosystem that might you know, lead to improvements in bone mineral density. So we, we, it's a no brainer to say heavy impact, multi-directional loading seems to be helpful, but are there other things that we could do as well? Mm. That's what we're, we always should be open to. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. That complex system. It's uh, that's something it. that's coming up more and more. I think now, I guess, I guess it's trendy too. Maybe complex systems are trendy now too. So yeah. Like look at the red stuff. Like if, if people's bone mineral density improve is improves with, addressing the reds and you never change the the loading on the person then you it means you don't have to just change the loading you have to change your response to that loading mm -hmm. so could it be that exercise without heavy loading might do something else to help the response of the system to what they're already doing in their life i don't know mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah and that's you know you could say the same thing with sleep they're not sleeping so now they're you know yeah something's happening bone wise you know whether it's laying it down or using it up um, yeah, you could see that for sure. Right. And I, I think that replies, you know, this idea of pain, we're not talking so much towards pain. We'll get there in a second, but that's, you know, to keep in mind here, when we're talking about the movement optimism and your cup analogy, which we've talked and we'll link to the past episodes, is just this idea that you don't have to necessarily do, you know, <laughs> clamshells or something to get out of knee pain. Uh, no, I mean, there's probably lots you can do like that if you, and you don't have to do leg extensions or squats. You, hmm. you could run to get out of knee pain. You could do hops. You could train your cat. Like there's all kinds of things. It's just, it's difficult. Well, and that's the the avoidance copa we talked about earlier, right? Like that's the risk really is that like if you stop doing everything, you know, as far as exercise or, or everything, you know, as far as everything, uh, you might actually start seeing things worsen because the ecosystem is is maybe getting weaker or less healthy in other ways. Y yeah. And then there's a the psychological aspect of just like, that cycling or running was their life and that's who they are. And then you remove that from people and that's, that's a real issue. And now they're anxious and depressed and they have no hope and their expectations are changed. And suddenly, you know, the, the pain increases because they're suffering more. Cool. So I'm going to turn the spotlight on both of us, I think. Uh, Mr. Mr. Positives here. Uh, you know, we both, I think, have hamstring pain right now, persistent, worsened when driving. Is that what describes your hamstring pain or, yeah, or discomfort right now? Yeah. 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 Don't like sitting. <laughs> well, I've been sitting on the floor partially because we're, I'm in this like little attic. We'll call it our recording attic, sure. um, which sort of helps, but not. It, it, it's probably good because I'm stretching most of the day and like opening my hips and everything, but then it comes with things. But the driving is just like the worst thing. Yeah. Yeah. Right. leg. is yours the right leg too. No left. 
Oh, do you drive with your left? It. Do you have a wrong side drive car? I uh, know it's just sitting. No, it doesn't matter if my leg's straight or not. Huh? Yeah. And for months too. Yeah. That's the nature of it is if, especially if it's more tendinous than muscular, mm -hmm. they, they, as you, they, they take time and I'm prone to tendon issues. So, mm. and you think well, it's some, more in a tendon than like muscle? Oh, mine is right. Well, there's a possibility I got to get checked out. I might have ripped something off of the bone and <laughs> I had an avulsion. Well, so That's... I worry that I did. I, again, this is my uh, persistence, I guess. I don't have any like popping moment or anything like that, right? Like it just sort of happened. I don't, I can't tell you when it really came on. I could probably figure it out, but like there was no, and yeah. there's my hamstring. Yeah. Is it in the muscle belly? I think or so you... more. Yeah. Like it's not like right up, it's higher, but it's like, not at the pelvis or at the junction. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so that, I mean, rehab wise, I don't know if you want to hear that you, you need to, to load it and same with me, but, mm -hmm. uh, normally doing nothing provided you're not returning to anything. <laughs> I wouldn't adv advise doing nothing unless you're returning to doing nothing, like just walking, you can get right. away with not doing a lot. The reason we do rehab like on things like this is because you want to return to something that involves heavy loading and stuff like that yeah like i no, just started sprinting this morning because okay. i want to return to softball yeah sprint sprinting it was a 6 30 mile well, i don't know what that is in clones just on my on my treadmill okay but not really so slower than my old 5k pace <laughs> gotcha gotcha yeah and so i guess that's it right it's just trying to find that that thing um i would say i probably have been avoiding things like stiff leg like a one leg deadlift or something like that I don't know if that's getting into the, the area. So here's, this is the challenge. This is all rehab right here is sometimes we back off and we avoid those things that aggravate it. And then at some point in time, we say, no, we need to do the thing that we're missing. That's why in the running course, I give two cases. One is someone where it's, he's a really good runner where we just backed off. He, he was already doing enough. And then we slowly built him up. And some, someone else was like, you've backed off for a year and a half. Everything you do hurts. We, we want to get you running again. You need to start running. You need to do these things that aggravate mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. and just build you up to do the things that build you the want. Capacity. Yeah. Yeah. E or what? Yeah. And then if we're lucky, so, so sometimes the pain stays the same, but they're, they, you know, doing 20 times what they're doing before that's a success. Sure. And then the A goal is like, they're doing 20 times and suddenly they're like, holy shit, I don't feel the pain anymore. Just right. Which again, could be the, their self-confidence, you know, they feel like they can accomplish things. Um, yeah. Yeah. Or just blood flow or. You know, yeah. It's just, it's hard, but for people need to understand, especially as you age and you're active, like you're going to have these things that hurt. Mm -hmm. And as long as you know, you're safe and you've been well checked out, it's, it's usually okay. Like to, to push into some discomfort. And sometimes it, it just takes time. Like, mm -hmm. and you're, there's nothing wrong with you. It's just sucks. Yeah. And I wonder if that's, you know, talking about those coping strategies we started with, that's almost where there's like a bit of a calibration. If you can start being reflective or objective on yourself, where it's like, I'm the person who like always pushes till my hamstring snaps off the bone. Like maybe when I do feel that niggle next time, I do have like a blanket, like, nah. sure. <laughs> yeah. you know, one niggle and I just start walking for that day or something like that. Whereas, as you say, other folks are going to be you know, it's okay to have a little bit of discomfort if you're running or something like running is not a pain-free activity generally, right? Sometimes. And if that's important to you, you ha have to do it. In the knee osteoarthritis space, we pretty much say now, like it, not, it's totally fine and normal to have pain when you're doing these exercises, mm -hmm. right? If you're the one of the ones where it doesn't hurt when you do it, well, congrats, you're, you're lucky. But if 50% of like, I don't know what this data is, but a lot of people will have it. Yeah. Yeah. Which and, is powerful. And right. Okay. And it's, it's, it optim powerful. it's optimistic as much as it's pessimistic. You're going to have pain, but you know, that's, it's normal. It's okay. It's, it's not a barrier to you doing better and doing the things that you love. Mm -hmm. And then it's weird. It's like, you always wonder sometimes when I work with people, if like they have the same amount of pain, but they're happy because it doesn't bother them anymore. It's a, it's a weird shift that you'll get with people. You they see still rate it the same, same, you mean, or like the pain is still there? I bet it, and the research, it comes down, like there's a really great study where the, it was super successful, but the pain only went from six to four. Or And same with the NeoA, it goes from 4.8 to 2.8. But these mm -hmm. people are like happy. <laughs> right. Like they're, oh, it's just my knee, it's sore, cool. 
I'm totally fine. I'm doing mm -hmm. what I love. This is awesome. Yeah. 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 I don't need a replacement, you know, it'll be stable. Right. Right. Hmm. Well, I will say I've been getting the odd more like five hour ride in and trying to get back down into like the drops on the road bike, which is like the most compromised position for this hamstring thing, right? Because you're, yeah. you're bent over and, you know, I don't know what else is going on around the seat and stuff. But I will say now when I ride for like more normal times for me is like 90 to three hours, say 90 minutes to three hours. It, it's actually not bugging me. So then it's sort of like, oh, <laughs> well, I just had to ride for five hours where it was a little uncomfortable. So that's that's my strategy. It's just ride longer, and then the normal rides will be okay. There, I, I've had patients through the years. When I teach through the years, I've had people give these talks where they talk about someone saying they've had some tendon issue for years. They've tried everything, and finally they say, "Screw it!" And they go on like some eight-hour rock or hike. Right. Hurts like mad, and then they get back, and two days later, they're like, "I'm fixed." <laughs> like they they just <laughs> give up. They say, "Like screw it." They hammer it like your five-hour ride, and they're like, "Yeah, that's all I needed." There's okay. always those stories, which are so bonkers. So in our cases, you know, it's not necessarily bugging us. I think you sort of just sat it out for a while and just figured, you know, maybe it'll go away from resting. I didn't. Yeah, that, I, I didn't experiment because it was just I didn't have like any athletic goals after August. And I was just curious, what if I do nothing? I wanted to like and uh, and it did nothing. <laughs> so like damn it i'm gonna have to put some work in so that's one side so right, we'll move to our next case study we were sort of this loose case study i guess um where it's okay i think some good themes came out of there so this next one's a little more i will say intense in that there's been knee pain that's taken a cyclist away from cycling like i never had to stop or anything and barely again it's really driving that was like i'm not really that bummed that i don't like driving anymore um this case, it was a cyclist, young cyclist who had knee pain uh, above the the knee, so into the quad, uh, persistent over a bunch of weeks, even with like resting, staying off the bike for, you know, at least a week. Um, there was some test rides, which we'll put in quotes. Um, they don't apparently count as riding. Uh, they have a history of back pain and a lot of like kin tape uh, use on the back, like for extended, extended time. Um, and they now find that cold is helping, but heat is not. Um, but it's not really affecting their rides, but after rides, it'll, especially after two hour rides, it'll flare up. So there's a, a bunch there, a little incomplete, I know, but where would you go with this person? They've seen physios, but it's still sort of there. They're still a little bummed about it. And they have a couple of these still icing, still taping. Yeah. So always with these things, you, you want to rule out anything sinister. That, that would be the idea. Uh, like the worst thing, I'm not saying this person has this, but you're always thinking, is there like a bone cancer or something? So you'd, you'd, you'd rule that out with the history and, and all that stuff. And then you think, could this be a stress fracture? And you would say, probably not if they're riding and it, it doesn't really hurt. And then you want it to be a knee problem. So meaning is let's make sure this isn't coming from the spine, right? Can we reproduce it with the spine stuff? Do we have to do some treatment for, for the back or something? that we wanted mm, to be uh, because fiddled. of the previous back stuff oh mm. no just in general okay. just in general but you you'd want to look at that can you recreate it with 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 back stuff and then and then you're like okay why why do people recover our, our big basic theory is like pain occurs when all the stressors in your life exceed what you can tolerate so that's it so do we like decrease what he's doing or do we add more Mm -hmm. Right. So what, what are the areas that we can optimize with, with this person? And it, it might be like, you could use cycling as rehab for them. So when they did that two hour ride, like, was that the only one they did that week? Were they riding every day, which I'd rather see, like, maybe could you do daily riding bouts of 30 minutes, 30 mm -hmm. minutes in the evening, if you want to ride more, like what's, what's the dosage? Like, how have they really built themselves up, you know, to, to, to tolerate it again. And then, there's a touch of reframing there. Like ask the person, what does it tell you that you feel pretty good when you're riding and you're just sore later? Like that, that's, that's a good thing to me. That implies like maybe we need to add more activity elsewhere, right? The, the, your body responds to these stressors. So let's add some other stress. Mm -hmm. That's where exercise would come in or running or cross training. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Is so there the, too much inactivity around it? Maybe just because trying to avoid getting knee pain or something. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I like, will say they you'll like this. There's two other little pieces I didn't give you there. Um, 
they they found that it flared up um they had a three-day block of life stress that flared it up a few days ago for three days it got worse because they had like really stressful time so that was sort of interesting they acknowledged that yeah um and, and go ahead and so when they bring that stuff out you double down there and ask like okay what does that tell you about your knee and the pain so mm -hmm. it's, it's not just the knee it certainly is the knee but so are there other things we could do and that's where you that's where you want to have look at talk about reds relative energy deficiency you can talk about sleep which is hard to say change they have school or work stress they have other emotional stressors go, going on and it's not that you can change these things it's just just more understanding mm -hmm. right and then so they they might they might have to go through about a few weeks or months of like nudging into discomfort with rotting but they know that they're safe this is just how sensitive their knee is yeah and so we would do like the do a little bit more even if it hurts and then as the coach too this is where i sometimes i'm like but why did it have to be two hours did you like it's your like maybe we increase the frequency and like could we do more yeah. 30 you know maybe 30 minutes in an hour because i wonder if this is like two hours used to be like the standard ride but then we're back there pretty quickly you yeah. know, and maybe an hour, you know, as in maybe more frequently or like a morning and an evening. All that type of stuff. So, such a fun way to practice that that style or like in the ad, uh, changing up your pace in that hour long ride and not mm -hmm. always easier. Well, you know, when you have knee pain, when you run, I swear there's a subset who rather run faster. Yeah. Yeah. I just pick up the pace. I think it would be similar with biking because you'd do different things if you were working, you know, harder, right? So it might even be a variable pace or cadence, you know, with cycling's nice because you can mix that stuff up a little bit more too. Yeah. 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 That, that that's the idea. And then and then then you always want to say, do I need a specific exercise? And that wouldn't hurt. You could add squats and leg extensions and stuff with the same hypothesis there. G give it a try for a while. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Especially because this is looking like a quad thing, right? Like it's yeah. Yep. Yeah. Because the, the the theory of like of why rehab exercises like that are sometimes helpful is um when we're in pain, we have this ability to protect the joint, to offload it a little bit. And you could definitely do that when you're cycling. You just well, actually you can measure it, I guess, with your through the pedals. So if if they're using the other side more, they were not really getting a good stimulus on the painful side. So like isolated leg, left leg, it's the left leg would might help that. To build mm. it up to tolerate cycling hmm. yeah you're it's wondering one of the ex exercise is weird we we don't know the mechanism just in general we see that it's helpful so it's worth going for it and i just load heavy because it checks a lot of boxes mm -hmm. which i guess would be another question right is is there strength training in the picture right because a that would give some more activity in the day um yeah. some, some more variety and then maybe you know would strengthen something that could be beneficial strengthen or we would use words like it just like you said, capacity, it just builds up your tolerance here. It could be the muscle, it could be the tendon, it could be the joint cartilage, you know, you just want to get more stress here. It's not, all, you, you've had enough of a rest, maybe. It seems like they've had enough rest. That would be the concept there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Love it, love it. Yeah, so I think those are some good thoughts. And I think the frequency and the volume is probably a good piece. And then, yeah, what are the other things you say, what, what are the other things you can do to be healthier? I always think of that yeah. question too, right? Like, can we add a, a nap or a meditation thing in there or, you know, a little extra snack here and there? It's the, those ones are tougher. Cause it's a weird, like I always stay in the physical for most people, but now you're getting, these are healthier. That's weird. Why are you asking about my relationships? You know? <laughs> <laughs> and so it doesn't always resonate with people who are like, yeah, just hear me out. Just think about this. And then you learn know, like the background of the ecosystem and that stuff. And then sometimes it clicks for people, mm. cool. but otherwise it's a weird one. That's why reds is a good one. This is what I mean by healthier. It's not yeah, just the strength I'm, of your knee. It's, it's the health of your system. It seems like it's a pretty good one to go after for sure. Especially with younger cyclists. Like it's not always, you know, it's, as you know, it's not on purpose, but it's, you know, the, we're trying to increase training volume and just, they aren't cooking enough. Right. Or they're trying to save yeah. money or they don't, they're stressed, you know, they're running between all these classes in school. It's very easy if you're trying to push up volume as a young person. Yeah. 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 Okay. Last question then for you here. Um, you know, we're, we're actually working on a book around sort of this idea of mountain biking, you know, off-road cycling being like a great way to age, right? We've seen a lot of good examples of people who are aging well, you know, even though it seems like a risky thing to do into your old age. So I, I thought maybe just to finish, you could, you know, ponder here, like how you're thinking about, it doesn't have to be mountain biking, obviously, but like riskier behavior, you're a skateboarder, you're a back flipping gymnast, 
Um, I'm not sure what else. You're into electric vehicles, I've heard recently as well. So how are you thinking about this, like risks of doing these activities as, as people are getting older? And, and, and how are you optimistic about that? So to me, it has to be the trade off with the fitness. So actually, I'm not skateboarding a lot anymore because of the trade off. So I get no fitness benefits, benefits from skateboarding. That's the thing. It's not a workout uh, for me. And the injury risk is so high. So I'm like, I'm, I'm going to do, do less. That's the thing. And I'm going to double down more on my gymnastics because I can mitigate the risk and it's better for my fitness and the things that I want. So that it's as simple as that. What, what, what's, what's the risk and, and what, what's the benefit? Yeah. Yeah. And you, you do know. that a little bit with your daughters too, still or no, or do they don't let you come anymore for gymnastics? Yeah. The youngest one, I was in the oldest two when they were seven and 10, I was in their cheerleading tumbling class, which best time of my life. And now the young, and I had to earn it. It was level three. So back handstrings and backflips. Uh, now they're too good. So I couldn't be in their class. But the 10-year-old could be in her class, maybe, but she won't let me. Fair enough. It's tough having three girls, I imagine. Yeah. So like with gymnastics, like you, I, I, I choose what I do. I'm not throwing. I have thrown double backflips on the tramp, but I had a coach and I worked up to it and I was in a harness and then he threw in a mat. I don't go up my trampolines out there now. I'm looking at it. I'm not going to go throw, just chuck it later, you right. know? And sometimes I have old, like I, this happens. I know when you age, like you get lost in the air. I went in last week and I, I started, I did a couple of flips and I didn't know where I was. And I felt a little discombobulated before. And I was like, I'm not going to force this. Mm. I'm going to go do some core work and go home. <laughs> right. Right. So there's I, also, there's like the risk reward, but then there's also sort of this like knowing when the what day is the day to to do it at all or don't yeah. be an idiot you don't need to push yeah. it you, you know i always I, I have to say to myself why am i doing these things and i'm like okay let's just focus on what what the benefit is you know now do you see done. like I, I don't want to push you too much on this but it was you know why not just you know ride a peloton in your in your basement versus doing gymnastics so i'm in my gym clinic and i i do force myself to do bench press shoulder press and some some squats and deadlifts i just hate it i'd rather do just go and play the reason i do those things is because you're getting attributes that i probably won't get from gymnastics like for building muscle building bone density that type of stuff mm. you know i was just on the treadmill sprinting earlier and all i do is i make myself run 10 minutes a day because i hate being on the treadmill mm -hmm. so that's yeah. it so like yeah. i just because i have to so that's why I don't do that stuff because I hate it. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not all for enjoyment. I, I like it. I like it. Okay. No, you have to. Like, I don't like brushing my teeth either. You, I really don't. I know that sounds weird. I don't. I like, I hate, I don't like brushing my teeth. It's weird. Should I have a brush my teeth today? I have to go brush my teeth. Like, but I'll go force myself. I'm lazy. Gotcha. I haven't gotcha. showered today. <laughs> I don't like showers. So there you go. We've both admitted <laughs> weird know? things about each other. Well, we have to, we have to I do those things. All right, Greg. Well, we've covered a bunch of stuff here. We'll see how people like it, but uh, if they like any of this, certainly I think, you know, we'll continue to refer folks to you and that's at greglayman.ca. Uh, I imagine you can find anything as far as booking consults and that sort of thing for any physio needs. Uh, your podcast is the Movement Optimism Podcast. Uh, yeah. which we'll link to as well, which I think everyone would enjoy. There's great conversations and some really cool people on there. And then we'll also link to your YouTube, of course, as well, uh, where people can find some of that information about OA and movement optimism. Um, what else am I missing that's on the YouTube that people would like? Oh, there'll be like nitty gritty talks on like spine flexion or spine stability, just like a lot of debunking stuff. I don't do much of that anymore. Oh, uh, the paint. Uh, like the patient uh, pain science stuff is on. Yeah, there's stuff on pain. Yeah, like you're not broken. Yeah, that's what we've had you on before too. About yeah, that, yeah. That definitely. I, sorry, was, my website has, a, for those dealing with persistent pain, things like that, I have a book called Recovery Strategies. It's free, downloadable, no email. Many uh, different languages as well. Oh yeah, it's in like 11 or 12, I think. Yeah. People have uh, through the years uh, translated it for me. Cool. So I really like that. I tell that's the best one out there. It's the Love cheapest it. one. And finally, courses. You're in person. You do have these couple of online courses, but you are in person. I know you have a Waterloo, Ontario one coming up. And where's the other one? I know that's abroad coming up in the US. Oh, I, next week I'm in Ottawa. Then I'm in Gilbert, Arizona. 
and then Miami in April and there you go. Sussex and and stuff Surrey in the UK. Yeah. Okay, there you go. You're back Two traveling. to three times a month. Yeah, yeah, I'm out there. <laughs> Sitting on planes. awesome. Well, we appreciate it, Greg. Thanks for being on. Yeah, thank you. Thanks so much for tuning in to the Consummate Athlete Podcast. If you want to hear more training, racing, and endurance sport advice, make sure you subscribe to the podcast and leave us a rating and review. You can also subscribe to our newsletter at consummateathlete.com for a weekly dose of inspiration and advice straight to your inbox. 